Hey friends, my name's Stevie Taylor. Welcome to the Gig Life Podcast. My guest today is John Hardacre. John is a Sydney-based jazz, blues and rock guitarist, band leader, graphic designer, music blogger and music reviewer for Australian jazz. He formed and led the JHD Revival Band and now has a new modular group, the John Hardacre Direction, which he formed out of a need to adapt to the ever-changing Sydney live music scene. Um, I always take a lot from our conversations and this one was no different. Enjoy. Cheers. I think we're rolling. We're rolling. John Hardacre. John Hardacre, well pronounced. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome to the Gig Life Podcast. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, thank you for having me in your home. I'm honoured. Beautiful home. Thank you. In uh, lovely Croydon. Yep. And um, didn't need the umbrella. Didn't need the umbrella, yep. that's good for my, yes, my, my, my shitty uh, um, guttering problem, which is very un unglamorous rock and roll. I'm sure Mick Jagger doesn't have guttering problems, but hey, you know, I'm sure he has other if problems. you don't know what we're talking about, John messaged me this morning saying, mate, when you get here, ring me and I'll come out with an umbrella because it's supposed to be raining and my guttering stuff. And I said, and I said don't right. ever tell anybody yeah. that. Oh, did, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, what are you up to, man? That's your latest project. Okay, what am I up to? Yeah. Right, okay. So, I've... Uh, uh, recently gone back to first principles, uh, that being that, um, uh, God, when was it? Um, a number of years ago, I had a power pop band called uh, John Citizen, and we did a bunch of gigs around the place, uh, which was really great fun. Um, and it just got to the stage where I was, um, I'm sure many musos will relate to this, uh, you get to the point where you care more about uh, are you appearing in the music papers, uh, are you competing with other bands, blah, blah, blah. And music, the music itself gets pushed further and further down the list. So it's about fourth or fifth on the list. Look, it's 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 an occupational hazard for a band leader, Mm -hmm. which is fine. But I would become bitter about it and I would look upon my fellow musicians and I'd go, how come he got the gig and I didn't, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, and it was really a, a, a bad place. Mm-hmm. And a little red light goes off in my head when that happens. So I stopped. Mm-hmm. I just stopped. Yep. And um, I, I would just uh, sit around the house and I'd pick up the guitar and I'd just start playing, you know, jazz and blues stuff, which was exactly the opposite of what I'd done in this power pop band. Um, and I, I found I really, really enjoyed this stuff. I, I love playing it. So I thought, okay, I'll get together a nice little um, uh, trio to perhaps sit in the corner of some restaurant and just play bossa nova stuff or some jazz standards, which I, I just I just love them. I just enjoy that music. So that's fine. So, okay, within three years, it was a nine-piece, horn-driven, <laughs> soul-funk blues band. <laughs> So, okay, so much for that plan. But it was a wonderful band called the JHD Revival Band, um, which is a band I will always uh, bless everybody who's ever been in it and remember it totally fondly. Um, The reason I scaled that band back uh, was that, you know, trying to get gigs for a trio is hard enough. But trying to get gigs for a nine-piece band is, is, is hard, but... It's compounded by the fact that you have nine uh, really great players in it. So if you, you're a great player, you're generally busy. So uh, yeah. I get a gig and I go, okay, can we all do this gig? So yeah. a few couldn't, a few yeah. could. And it just it, it just wore me out. Hey, it's not their fault. Yep. I mean, Jesus, you know, they're in-demand players, terrific players, you yeah. know. So I, I thought, okay, I'm going to pull back. I'm going to pull right back and start back again, not quite playing bossa nova in the corner of a restaurant, but just back to a, um, a, small, uh, a smaller unit, a modular unit. So I, I looked for um, a bass player, uh, 
slash vocalist. Um, so I could do duos, I could do trios, I could do quartets, mm -hmm. I could just build the band, but the smallest module would be the bass slash vocalist and me yep. on guitar. Yep. Um, yeah, and I found, you know, a, a, a brilliant young vocalist called Lauren White, who's a fabulous bass player, and another uh, young vocalist called uh, Sarah Angel Homer, mm -hmm. Homer, um, who, who, who plays bass and sings, mm -hmm. and I've been doing gigs with these people, um, plus, uh, you know, drummers, a couple of drummers, uh, Luke yep. Robinson and Cat O'Connor. Yep. Uh, yeah, and just been doing exactly what I want to do, and, Great. It's, and it's an absolute pleasure. Great. Hmm. Now, let's... Now that we know what you're doing now, let's yep. roll it right back. Okay. Right. So, were you born in Sydney? I was born in Sydney. Yep. Um, in 1957. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yep, I was born in Sydney, 1957. Uh, the house that we're in at the moment, that you and I are speaking in, mm -hmm. is my family home. Oh. It's been my family home since 1960. Right. So, I've lived in this house since I was three years old. Fantastic. 58 years ago. Yep. Um, yeah, it's always been my family home, um, which is bizarre, but that's just the way, you know, it's just the way it, it has been. Yep. Um, yeah, which is fantastic. And um, uh, grew up in this house with my, my parents. Um, Musical family? No, that's a funny Not thing. Not at all? Um, my father, my mother liked, she, my mother was German, um, and being German, you just grow up with music, mm -hmm. uh, you know, classical music, of course, um, Mozart, plus also German, European folk music. My father was one of the two people I've ever met in my life who actually disliked music. I've never met anybody who've, who's disliked, who dislikes music, mm -hmm. um, but my father actually disliked music. He found it an irritating noise. noise. Mm -hmm. When my mum had the radio on, he'd ask for it to be turned off. Which is very strange because everybody strange. likes everybody some some kind of music, however yep. crap it might be, or you know, you know, commercial or whatever it might be. There's something in music for everyone, except my father and one other person. And he never whistled. Never. No, no he, he he utterly dis, no, utterly disliked music. Wow. Yeah, which is very very strange. He was he was British. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I don't say English, he was British, because there's a bit of a difference, because he was very stiff upper lip. Gotcha. He found um, music and art and stuff uh, entirely, entirely just decorative. You know, it was non-masculine, just decorative. And the irony of that is music and art are the two things that, are the props of my life, you know, which yeah. is very strange, yeah. you know. Mm. I mean, I make a living out of art. I'm a graphic designer. Yeah. Um, but I also, music, I've, I've, I've played my entire teenage till now life, you know. Right. I've never, so you started in your teens? Yeah, I started. I, no, sorry. Yeah. No, no. When, I, when I, I first got a guitar when I was about 12 years old um, and I, I wrestled with it. I had lessons. Um, but the guy was teaching me Peter, Paul and Mary stuff where I actually just wanted to listen. I, I wanted to play Jimi Hendrix stuff. Yeah. And I couldn't quite understand how my guitar, which was acoustic, yep. didn't sound like Jimi Hendrix's guitar right. or look like Jimi Hendrix's guitar. And then I, I, was, I bought an, an electric guitar. Uh, a family friend made me an amplifier. Man, I wish I had that amplifier. It was a handmade valve amp from a, from a kit out of an electronics magazine. And he, he, he encased, it was a project for him, uh -huh. and he encased it in a, with, a, with one 12 inch speaker, he encased it in a, a gorgeous, uh, beautifully lacquered wooden uh, combo case that he built himself. And I got rid of this thing. God knows why. I'm still kicking myself, you know. But it was most beautiful. And it would probably sound exquisite, you know, like beautiful old valve set up, hand-wired, you know, all the boutique stuff, you know. Um, but I got rid of it like an idiot, like a kid. Um, yeah, so, so, so but, but, but still, I just couldn't um, figure out how this music was made. And, one, and for Christmas, my father always used to say, what do you want for Christmas? And I said, I want a wah fuzz pedal. 
And he said, and he got me one, and it cost him, and he told me that it cost him $12, and it, it had a wire, the worst wire I've ever heard, and definitely the worst fuzz I've ever heard. <laughs> I wish I still had it, though. Yeah, yeah. Because it had that vintage kind of crunch, you know, yeah. like a, it just a beautiful... A really ugly sound, but but a, but it would be a sound now that I think people would like seek yeah, out. You know, yeah. it was a yeah. It's funny, and, people, yeah, people are starting to chase those old sounds again. Aren't they? It's funny, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. De it's, definitely, definitely. And 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 this was a uh, all I know was that I plugged it in and I put on the the, the fuzz and the wah, and I just thought that's the sound I want. Yeah. A completely distorted mess, you know. <laughs> it's a, and I just oh God, I loved it. Yeah. And, and did you uh, get lessons? Yes, I yep. did. Um, as I say, I got Peter, Paul and Mary lessons with a folk, a, a local folk guy. Um, I hated them. It, it was nothing like the music I wanted to play. Yep. Um, we did All Along the Watchtower, but I thought, this doesn't sound like All Along the Watchtower, but of course he was teaching me the Dylan version, uh -huh. you know. Um, and uh, so I didn't get any lessons at all. And I think like a lot of rock and roll guitar players, you know, you just sit in your bedroom and you just try and nut this stuff out. Yep. And every now and again, you might get something that sounds a little bit like that. And then you go and get together with other people who are trying the same thing, you know. And I was lucky to get together with a few local blokes and we would, uh, you know, get together and try and sort, suss out this stuff. And it's quite funny, you know, I mean, even though now I have every guitar I would ever wish for, I have beautiful amplification, the gigs I do with brilliant musicians through great PA systems, blah, blah, blah. But I will never, ever again get the same rush that I got from sitting in a garage yeah. and just slam making pretty crap noise yeah. with other people. Yeah. The rush was just thinking about it now makes my hair stand up. Awesome. You know, and, and I mean we chase that our whole lives, mm. but we get a little bit jaded along the line. But you know, the first time you ever got together with a band, you're all plugged in and you just slammed away. Yeah. Everything was wrong with it. Yep. Yeah. But it was so beautiful. So absolutely beautiful, you know. It's a yeah, mm. nostalgia. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yes, as, but so I didn't get any lessons until uh, I don't know. I, I I started to I went to a record shop and I bought. It was an import record shop called Anthem Records in the um, Town Hall Station Concourse in Sydney. And it was imported records. And we would go there to get the, the heavy stuff because the local record shops never had it. So I bought an Allman Brothers record and a Mahavishnu Orchestra record mm -hmm. called Birds of Fire. Mm -hmm. And the Allman Brothers record I, I instantly loved because it was blues and mm -hmm. boogie and, and that stuff. The Mahavishnu Orchestra record, I had no idea what this was. Yeah. I, I just blew my head off. Yeah. And somebody had said to me, oh, this is a guy you got to check out. Yeah. I hated it. I thought, oh, right. what, I thought, what is what is this garbage, you know? Yeah, yeah. This was before I, I ever smoked dope, you know? Yeah. So I think drugs, um, you know, um, would never condone them. But <laughs> I know in my own case, drugs opened my head up greatly yeah. to music. Yeah. Um, so I was probably about 14 or 15 when before I ever took any drugs um, with the Mahavishnu Orchestra record. So I listened to it and I thought, I hate it, and I put it away. <clears throat> but it was always sitting there, it's kind of looking at me, you know, like... Um, so I would listen to it occasionally, and, and I, I ended up becoming transfixed by what is this and how is this music made? So somebody said to me, well, that's jazz. He's a jazz guitarist. And I thought, no, he's not. I've heard jazz, like, yep. you know... Louis, Louis Armstrong, that's jazz. You know, he said, no, 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 this guy's a jazz guitarist. So I listened to jazz guitarists like Wes Montgomery. I thought, no, John McLaughlin's nothing like that. And I think obviously now we know that they couldn't really put him in any pigeonhole. So they said jazz. It wasn't rock. Right. So they just lumped him in with all the weird sounding music, which was jazz. And they didn't have all these little off genres that we've got. No, they, no exactly. <laughs> they did. They had big block genres, Hyphen, big, big block. Well, you know, even the even like even the Allman Brothers had a lot of jazz in their play and a lot of Latin stuff, you know, yep. beautiful stuff. Yep. And um, yeah, so McLaughlin, um, 
I thought, okay, jazz, jazz. I need to understand this, what this guy's doing. Yeah. So I, I took lessons from a jazz guitarist, a local guy, and you know, I thought, no, he's just teaching me this. We did a Mickey Baker book, which I refer to those chords to this day. You know, I didn't realize that at the time. I thought it sounded hokey, but it was brilliant, beautiful, you know. Um, so we did this Mickey Baker book and it was just, uh, you know, jazz standards, honeysuckle rose, etc. Um, and I thought, now this isn't what I want to learn. And through, in and I was in wedding bands at the time and one of the drummers in the wedding band, like, you know, in those days, you'd, you'd, you'd play all this disco stuff and all these wedding waltzes but you would, you'd talk to the musos and we'd all be talking about Chick Corea and Hendrix and all this stuff, you know. And this one drummer said, look, you know, I, I've, I've been um, in a band with John Robinson uh, and he can teach you this stuff that you want to know. And I remember John Robinson as a guitarist in the first version of an Australian band called Blackfeather. Mm. And he was an awesome player, brilliant. Um, their album called At the Mountains of Madness is, to me, like one of the... Australian psychedelic touchstones. Anywho, mm -hmm. um, so amazingly enough, Robbo had just started teaching and I went to him and he gave me the, the shit. He gave me the knowledge. He gave me everything. He's like a guru, you know, and he, he gave me so much stuff that my head was full and I left him because I just couldn't take it all in. And I've still, to this day, I'm still thinking about concepts that he gave me, you know, all the modes, all the arpeggios, all the modes based on um, uh, overtone modes. I just look; it, it just goes on and on. It's, it's 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 not as mathematical as it sounds, but it's beautiful. And I still use these concepts to this day. You know, I really do, and I and I I, I bless him for all, all that wonderful stuff he showed me. But he just literally blew my mind, blew my mind. You know, yeah. So that that was that. And really, I haven't had any lessons since because he gave me enough stuff mm -hmm. uh, for, for a lifetime. Yep. For a lifetime, you know. Yeah. So that's it. That's my, my educational yeah, yeah. qualifications. Yeah, it's just right. not much really, but yeah. yeah, it's good stuff. Yep. And mm. uh, when, did, when was your first sort of gigging band? First gigging band um, I uh, was... These like little wedding bands you kind of get into, yep. you know, um, you 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 know you're learning from somebody, and the, then the teacher says, uh, "Oh look, you know, um, I can't do this gig. Can you do this gig for me?" And they all, and you think, "Wow, really? You want me to do this?" And I didn't know what a gig was, you know. So I'd show up with my little amp and my my out of tune guitar, <laughs> and I'd I'd do you know, and the guy would never use me again. But the drummer would say, "Oh." A guitar, so you know the, the network kind of happens. Um, I think it's a lot more professional now than it was. You know, like back then it was. Well, maybe I, I, I have no real idea, but back then I think you know, it's people who just got stuff together and you'd, and we backed. I remember backing up a great singer called George Alexander, um, and he did a lot of stuff that at the time. Don't take offence if you're listening to this, George, but I thought it was the hokiest crap I'd ever heard in my life, and I loathed it, you know, because, of course, I was in the Mahavishnu Orchestra and Hendrix and blah, blah, blah. Um, but really, now, I'm so glad we did that stuff because it was, what would you say, it was the early to mid-70s, so the, the music we were doing was, was all the disco stuff, hot chocolate, um, excellent, excellent music, you know, really beautifully made music. And to sit down and actually try and figure out what that guitar player is doing, you know, once again, I still use that stuff to this day, you know, that choppy disco. And, and really, disco, what's disco? Disco was like funk, mm. where the producer said to the drummer, just keep the, the, the bass drum on the four. Yep. But you take the bass drum away and it's as funky as funk. Fuck, yeah. you know, pardon yeah. the French, but it really is great stuff, you know. So I had to learn all those great... Just take the syncopation out of it, basically. Yeah, yeah. basically it was, and yeah. it was just for the dance floor, you know. Yeah. But really, if you if you start chopping up the bass drum, it's yeah. really beautiful, yeah. groovy funk, you know. Yeah. And also, um, around about that time, um, I bought a MXR Phase 90. And it's an effect I still use to this day, which yep. is like 40 years later, right. you know. The, I, same, the same one? The same one. Yeah. Well, I've actually been through three. Oh, okay. Because one got water in it, one just died. Yep. 
And each time it, I get a new one, it's not quite the same. So yeah. I, I'd like to get one of those first generation ones. But anyway, yeah, yeah. I, I use very few effects. And that's one effect I've just always really loved the sound of, yeah. you know. But once again, it's that sound of disco, you know, that yeah. great whooshy kind of... Um, choppy phase phase sound yeah so those wedding wedding band stuff it was just really cool you know yeah. really good stuff to yeah. do you know yeah yeah, yeah. And, and how was the 80s for you what were you doing in the 80s what was i doing in the 80s having children pretty much okay yeah. <laughs> so yeah okay so my um my daughter katie was born in 1984 yep. um my son blair was born in 1988 uh when my daughter was born um i went right that's it forget music mm -hmm. I'm, I'm stopping a kid i'm just going to be a good dad yep. you know so for about four almost five years I, I sat around the house and um playing guitar and uh, but, but you know i i was here for the, the katie my daughter and i wanted to be a, a good dad and be part of the family and all that and then one day my wife said to me get out <laughs> go and play music you are miserable you're making us all miserable and I'm going no 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 she said don't argue with me just go yeah. and play music you yeah. know? so so I sort of started again I got it with like pub bands and just gradually kind of got my chops and and, and all that. I didn't even have an amp I'd sold my I'd sold everything except for one guitar yep. um yeah it was funny but but and I thought really am I that miserable she said oh yeah you're you're miserable you know you're, <laughs> you're miserable just get out and play yeah. music yeah. yeah very funny yeah and yeah and so from that point which was probably 1989 or something yeah till now I, I really haven't not played music which is, which is good yeah, yeah it is good which is cool yeah and you're a um you're a jazz music reviewer i write yes i write yes i, I do music, yep um and that just came about oh god how did I, I can't even remember how that came about uh, uh yeah wonderful lady lane elborn um she worked for I can't even remember the, the blog site, but she said, oh, you want to do this review of his Joe Bonamassa concert and get you a ticket? And I thought, oh, I don't know, I can't really write. But I read a lot about music, you know, and I read a lot of music magazines. Um, yeah, so I wrote this review and then I, I sort of, I'd written a bunch of reviews for various sites like the Orange Press and all that. Mm. So I thought I'd consolidate them on my own blog. Um, and so I started a blog God, I don't know, probably nine years ago now, mm. eight years ago. And um, I just cons I just put all the things I'd written for other sites onto my blog. And then I thought I'd just start writing them for my own blog, you know, and then I'd send them to other sites. And it's almost, it's, it's almost entirely jazz now for, yep. for one reason or the other. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I, they keep sending me these wonderful CDs and I listen to them and I write them up. And I think, I, you know, I, I, I just feel something like a big fat fake because I think, really, am, <laughs> do I, I don't know any, I'm, you know, do I know anything about this? And they always say to me, oh, that was a, you know, I get this a lot from musos uh, and, and it, it uh, enormously flattered in that they tell, they say to me, you know, you really, you really heard me, you really listened to what I was doing. And I, I find that wonderful when they say yeah, that yeah. because I thought... That's what I'm trying to do, and shouldn't everybody do that? If yeah. I'm reviewing something, yeah. especially jazz, because um, jazz is a is a is a form of art music that is not apparently, you know, you can listen. You know, the the, the point of pop or rock or blues is to come at you in a simple fashion, you yeah. know, and just hit you. Yep. Was jazz or modern classical music, or any form of art music, um, and I'm making the inverted comma sign here, art music. Uh, it, it's deeper than that, you know. So you can't just blow it off by saying, "Well, that's just noise," you know. You you have to respect these people, you know. And reading up about jazz, I'd I'd read about like you know people like Ornette Coleman would, you know, at the height of his almost the height of his fame, he was still an, an elevator operator yep. in New York. And I thought this guy is willing to be impoverished for this music. You can't just blow it off as noise. You know, so, yeah, so I made an effort to try and understand this music and I get sent some pretty challenging stuff and I stick with it and I, 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 I never just listen to it once. 
Um, sometimes I do if I th- if I if I think I've got it within one listen. But sometimes I think no, I no, I I don't really get that yet. So I'll, I'll listen it two or three times, and it might grab me. If it doesn't grab me, I don't write it up. Mm. I don't believe in putting shit on any for, musician's work. Just for the sake of... Well, for the, well they, I, know, I know as a musician the amount of work that's put into it. Yeah. You know, and really you can't just blow that off with a sentence, you know. Yeah. So I, and I've had a few people who get a bit narky going, well, why didn't you review my thing? And, and I say, well, you know, it just didn't really, you know, float my boat. Yeah. And I say, it's just a personal opinion. It doesn't mean it's... it's it, it, it doesn't mean it has no worth. Of course it does. It's it's great music, you know. Yep. And some there's a couple of people who've got a bit thingy about it. And I understand that entirely because look, they they've lived with this thing. They've sacrificed so much for this thing, and and you know they don't want to hear somebody say it didn't really grab them. I I never say it's bad music. There's been a couple of cases where it actually has been bad music, um, but very rare. It's, it's almost always good music. Yep. But, you know, I mean, I run a business. I have a family. I have my own musical thing. Mm. I have very little time to yep. really absorb this stuff, you know. Yep. And I don't believe in a, a three-paragraph yep. or two-paragraph review. I want to get deep into it, you know. So it's it's more about sort of, you know, quality than quantity with me. So I, I can't really get to everything I would like to It'd be lovely if I could, but you yeah. Know, yeah, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Uh, now, when did you start forming your own bands? Because that's something I. Um, that's 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 how I since I first met you. That's how I've seen you. You've oh, okay. always seemed to you know maybe not reinvent reinvent's probably not the right word, but you. You're always forming these new. I am. Yeah, it's, it's I know. Cool man, it's inspiring. Well, well, yeah. It's funny, you know. Sometimes I, I think to myself, uh, you know, is it is it just like an ego trip? But but I, I then my, my wife, who's you know the the wisest person I know, and I I bounce a lot of this stuff off her, and she says, look, she says, does anybody say to you, no, I don't want to play with you? <laughs> does anybody say, no, bugger off? You know, do they play with you out of pity? No, they don't. They play with you because they want to play with you. Yeah, yeah. And I think I've had a couple of people say to me, you know, we like to play with you because you're organised, and and you know, uh, that's that could be taken. You sort of think, well, no, don't don't you mean creative and brilliant? No, organised. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 look, that's a big part of it, you yeah, know. Yeah. And and seriously, Stevie, I mean, the, the one reason I do organize my own stuff even though it takes twice as much work as just being in somebody else's band Mm -hmm. is because i've had such a bad experience with disorganized musicians you know have you got a story you can tell uh you don't have to name names or bands or uh was there like okay yeah okay was there a tipping point i know there wasn't a tipping point but 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 um i I know i know that a lot of the, the early wedding bands i was in no uh, yeah, the early wedding bands, you know, the guy would just throw me a bunch of um, chart. They weren't charts, they were, they were, were sheet music born, bought from the shop, you know. And I would look at them and go, so you want us to do this exactly like the record, right? Yep. And they go, yeah, I do. And I think, can't we just, like, there's a fade out on this record. And he said, well, yeah, I want you to fade out exactly like the record. And I used to think, that's stupid. <laughs> it fades out on the record because they're in a recording studio and the guy's turning it down. You're a live band. And I'd say to the guy, well, why don't we just repeat that little tag at the front of the song and just end on that? And he'd look, to me, look at me like I was... And, and he'd look at me and you could see this cogs turning around his head and he'd look at me and he'd say, no, I want it just like the record. It was sort of like, you know, this this goes up to 11. You know, there's, yeah, yeah. there's no other way of thinking of it, you yeah. know. And so, and then I, I got in one of those wedding bands and the, I, I made some suggestions and, and one of the guys, I think it was a singer, the leader of the band said, okay, well, what about on this song? What would you do on this? And I thought, oh, this is good. And it wasn't a case of saying, oh, these people are obeying my orders. It was a case of, it sounds better. Yep. It just sounds better. Yep. And this guy knew that it just sounded better, you know. So I sort of um, 
so the next bunch of bands I was in were, were a little bit above a wedding band, but were still doing covers, but some really good covers. But I was an absolute prick. I was a horrible person. I, I forgot that I was dealing with human beings. Mm. And I really, really, I would just give orders. And I don't know how, I, I, I still got a couple of those people as friends. I'm surprised <laughs> I have any of them as friends, yeah. you know. Um, because what do you think that what do you think that was? Um, I was a nerd. I didn't have a girlfriend. Music to me was everything. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd sit in my room and I'd listen to Steely Dan or a band oh. like Steely Dan, and then I'd go to my band and go, "Why can't we play this song like Steely? <laughs> you know, we do something like." Did, did uh, you realise at the time that that song that you just listened to that that tracked Fifty Eight? No, oh, no, no. One I, drummer and no, then they put in another no, drummer. No, I didn't. That, well, that, that's the exact, <laughs> that's, that's the whole point of it. Yeah. I had no idea. No, yeah, yeah. I, I, we, would, we would do Josie, you know, yeah, and I'd yeah. go, why can't we get it as tight as that? <laughs> and I'd say, and they were great players. I yeah. were great players and they'd nail it as, as well as we could. And I would just be dissatisfied and I'd insult people and, oh my God, you know, it's just, it was just absolutely awful because I just, the music was absolutely at the, the top of everything. And, but it wasn't really the music, it was this kind of perfectionism. And perfectionism really is, it's a horrible thing. You know, Steely Dan, okay, it ends up sounding pretty perfect, but it's pretty soulful music, in yeah, my opinion. Yeah. At the bottom, it's soulful, you know. I've heard some LA session stuff that is just perfect, and it is utterly boring, <laughs> bland crap, yep. you know, soulless garbage, you know. Um, and I, I don't really know what shook me out of it all, because really, these people just kept coming back for more. No, no that sounds terrible. Um they, 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 the, the players, I think they could see that the band was really good and it was really tight, but I was an unsufferable dick, right. dickhead, a horrible person to know or to work with. Um, and I'm still proud of those bands, and I reckon that most people who were in them were proud of them, but it wasn't fun. It wasn't, it wasn't enjoyable, you know. Um, yeah, so... I think when I sort of stopped music entirely and then uh, resumed it after um, my daughter was a bit older, I uh, got back in, and I just got back into a pub rock band. Yeah, it's funny and it how, wasn't my band. It's it wasn't funny how kids band. can level you out, you know. Oh yeah, look. Because it, definitely. Yeah, before I had kids, I was fairly highly strung. Mm, mm. And. Um, yeah, kids just change everything. Well, they do. You know what it is, mate. It's it's well. That's cliche. My, my it's cliche, opinion, but it's no, it's not a cliche. It's 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 true because it's it's it grounds you in reality. You know, there's nothing more real than my God. You know, having a child, and I I would look at this child, and I mean, thank God, my wife is just like so together because there was moments where I thought, hang on, let me get this right. I. You know, me, who can barely look after myself, am responsible for keeping this little infant alive. And whenever I thought about it, I thought, and I had only recently actually started my own business. I started my own business four years before uh, Katie was born. So, and really, you know, in business, like after four years, you're still not making a million bucks, you yeah. know. Um, and Gail, my wife, was supporting me. Um, but of course, you know, she had to leave work. And I thought, man, you know, I've really got it going on now. And, and you just got to face reality. I mean, and, but it's, there's nothing more real than, than children and, 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 you know, it, it's, it's, it's nature. It's, it's the most natural thing. It's the only thing they haven't fucked up. You know, yeah. about, you know, because as, as, as humans, we're the worst animal ever. We can't do anything without yeah. all our tools and our <laughs> metal skins and our houses and, and all that stuff. We're pathetic. My dog, man, what a great dog can see <laughs> things miles away, can, can hear Mr. Whippy coming before I can hear it, you know, just wonderful. Um, but as, as animals, we, we just, we're just hopeless, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, so I had this, ran my business and then Katie came along. And I thought, oh my God, you know. Yeah, so when I got back into music after that, I was leveled out a lot. You know, I, I really was. I'd, I'd kind of 
<laughs> sort of beaten into submission by, by, by life itself. But I also realised that, A, I wasn't the centre of the universe. B, I didn't know everything. And, and, and C, I just wanted to have a bit of a boogaloo with my mates. Yep. And these were buddies of mine. And we had this pub rock band. And, man, you know, we did Credence. Great, just great rock and roll songs. You know, Elvis, Credence. Just the, you know, the rock and roll canon. And I thought... You know, fuck jazz. This is beautiful. I just look, and you and I listen into the Creedence stuff, and I listen into the, the the Elvis stuff, and I thought, God, there's some good stuff going on here. You know, and it reignited my love for, for um, you know, like first principles, like going back to rock and roll. Yep. You know, yep. because I'm, even though I, I play stuff with a jazzy edge now. I'm really basically a rock and roll guitar player and a, and a blues guitar player, and that that's where my heart really is. Yep. I love I love the, the the harmony of jazz and the the color that you can get with jazz, but you know honestly, man, you know you you play Elvis's Little Sister to me, and I just sit up, you know, because I think that's just the tempo's great, groove is great, all the Elvis Sun records stuff. What a cool guitar I, riff too. Oh, eh? Well, the guitar line is just yeah, yeah, yeah well, it is, and it answers the the vocal line. Little yeah, sister, yeah. don't you? And yeah, the little yeah, si- yeah. the little sister whines yeah. at him. Yeah, yeah. And so as Elvis is talking, yeah, it's yeah. just the same that that beautiful blues thing of BB King and Lucille just talking to each other. You know, it, it's a it's and honestly, you know, it's it's I've I've come back round, not quite full circle, but I realise now that you know people say, oh, you know. Rock, rock is easy, jazz is hard. That's garbage. It's all hard. It's all hard. Everything is hard. You try and play blues well as blues should be played, and it's as difficult as anything else. You know, all the microtonal inflections, if they could analyse Buddy Guy's solo, it'd be full of this stuff you can't even write down. Just this beautiful vocal... Oh God, you know, and I mean, so that that that's what I really love now, you know. I mean, I just love listening to these guys. Uh, you know, Eric Clapton is a great example. I've had a love hate relationship with Eric Clapton my whole life, you know. I've adored the guy, and then sometimes I go, Oh man, what are you doing? What's this crap you're playing? And then you know, a year later, I'm going, Oh, listen to that, you know. Or, so, what sort of stuff made you think that was crap? Oh well, no, uh, stuff that I thought was crap. Um, was when he subsumed his guitar playing to his uh, songwriting, um, because uh, you know tears, tears in heaven, the, that, the, kind of that stuff. Okay. You know, okay. I mean, and, and and I think you know. You, you, now I look at it and I go, no, he, he's great. That 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 is good music. It's good Obviously. good music, you know. But I mean, Eric Clapton really inflamed me with in, in Cream, obviously, you know. And even when he sort of got laid back with the. Um, I shot the sheriff and all that. He was still really nice guitar playing, and then I went off him for a while. And, 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 I, and I watched a DVD of um, the band's The Last Waltz, and he he's on there. And I and I know from his autobiography that he showed up, and he was he was he was smacked out. He couldn't get enough heroin, mm-hmm. and he was in a really bad way. And I listened to him play. I thought, man, if if that's how you play, in a bad way, I would love a little bit of that because. He just can't help himself. He's just yeah. got it in his fingers. He yeah. just puts on that Stratocaster and he just, just a little bit of a, a trill here and a, a vibrato there. It's just this gorgeous sound. He's an exceptional player, you know. There's one, there's a, there's a few videos that I saw when I was a bit younger that really shaped me too. And one of them was Eric Clapton, 24 Nights. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yep. yep. And yep. it was because I think he had th- there was three different bands for mm-hmm. that 24 nights sort of thing yep. and the one that really got me was um, he was playing guitar Nathan East was playing bass mm-hmm. Steve Ferroni playing drums yep. Yep. Greg Fillingane's playing keyboards mm. they, you know they, did, they were doing old cream <laughs> stuff and I know wow man yeah. you know Steve Ferroni had the sunburst pearl drum kit and I'll never forget it's it beautiful Eric Clapton had the wavy hair yeah yeah I used to just sit there for hours and I'm sure I wore that tape out yeah look I'm just fucking and, and you know it's funny to there. see those, those exceptional those those players who, who you know who've played at like the top level of everything it's like when you see the Tonight Show stuff you know you get some rock and roller on there and the band who can play anything yeah they love it 
<laughs> because I think it takes them back to a kind of a a, a, a root of, of, of why they got into music in the first place, you know, and I mean, I think you can never really lose that, you know, you shouldn't lose that, should you? I mean, it's, why, why do we even play music, you know, and I, and I think, wh- why, I, I, I can't even remember why I was initially so inflamed, but I, I think it was Hendrix, and I, I, I mean, some people sort of talk about Oh yeah, I was into music when I was eight. Well, I was into model aeroplanes when I was eight. Mm. I only got into music, it only meant something to me, I think when I was on the edge of puberty at like 12 or 13, you know. It seemed to link together with puberty. Prior to that, I was into Marvel comics and making aeroplanes, you know. Mm. But as soon as I got faint, yeah, it was, I don't know, it was like girls and are you experienced seemed to happen at the same time. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I went to a boys only school. Okay. So girls were like off the menu. Yep. Um, and and Hendrix was just was like plugging into a, a, a I, I listened to it the other day and I thought, this is still insane. This is still like a, a, a communication from the planet Pluto. I mean it yeah. it, it, it it's utterly incredible, yeah. you know. And you can, this is well, as I say, well before I ever got into drugs. Mm. I was just a little a, a kid um, at the beginning of teenage, but I remember listening to it just, just absolutely took my head off. And it still, and it has not lost one iota of its gloss to this day. Awesome. I can still listen to it and absolutely be transfixed by every everything on it, you know. And, and it doesn't sound old to me, it just is bursting with life and... You know, the production you've just got to overcome, but really the ideas and the... And I still, to this day, scratch my chin at how, how half those sounds were generated. Yeah, right. It's just a guy in a... Stu- he didn't even have any pedals. There isn't even a wah-wah pedal on yeah. that first album. Yeah. There's a kind of a... I think there's a kind of a crude fuzz box, but I don't think there's any uh, wah-wah, wah-wah at all. So, uh, yeah, it's just... Sorry, <laughs> rabbiting on. No, no, please. That's all of that. Um... <laughs> Now, I want to talk a little bit about the um, Sydney music scene, and we know how shit it is now, and what lockout laws have done, and mm. things like that. Now, when what what do you remember as like the the golden years in the Sydney music scene? Okay. Well, because I, I wouldn't have said I came to Sydney ninety four. I think ninety four. Like okay. Yeah. Well. Um, there definitely were golden years, uh, and they were well before my time, um, up until my time. Uh, I, I must say, I, I, as, as a gigging musician working in music uh, venues, clubs and pubs, um, I probably started in about um, uh, mid to late 70s, and honestly, you could gig you could gig seven nights a week if you wanted to with ease. Yep. Easy. You just have to call people up. You have, I mean, you'd have to be a good band, sure. you know, not a crap band. Mm. And, and I'm talking original stuff, not covers. Mm. You know, you, you'd have... God, the first band I was in... Um, yeah, it was just originals. We, we, we didn't even think about doing covers. Covers were what wedding bands did. And I wasn't doing that crap anymore, you know. So we'd all write songs and we'd, we'd go and get gigs and we had our own PA we oh my god you know it was just just yeah and, and honestly you could gig as much as you wanted to um, as I said my daughter was born in 84 I, I, I stopped music mm. completely and I came back probably early 90s mm. totally different situation mm-hmm. you know I got a band together and I um, and I, I rehearsed three sets because that's what I'd done before. Yep. I, w- I went to get a gig and the guy said, yeah, sure, and you've got 45 minutes. So I said, no, we've got three sets. We can do the whole night. Mm. He said, no, no, I've got three bands on. Oh, right. And I went, oh, okay. And you're paying $600 for the whole night for three bands. And he said, yeah. And, and I mean, I didn't fight with him because I thought, well, I'm, I'm still learning what's happened. In, but, so it, wasn't, it was a very short uh, period of time. Um, that things kind of changed. Uh, look, I I don't I, I don't really agree that the situation that Sydney is up the shit. 
Okay. I, I, I don't. Cool. I don't. Um, okay. Uh, I've I've run my own graphic design business since 1981. Um, over that time, I have uh, I've I've had high points and low points, but I'm, I've still survived. Yep. You know, um, I've done jobs for free, uh, hoping it'll lead to something else. Uh, in quite a few cases, it has. In a few cases, it hasn't. I don't care. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. um, now, I've I've always applied that kind of thinking to music, which is one reason I've pulled back to the smallest modular unit I possibly can okay, at yep. the moment. Yep. Because I thought the scene is is definitely different. Yep. But I'm modifying my. I'm 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 traveling light. I'm traveling really light, you know. Uh, the big band I had before, um, that was okay. That was then, and it was a struggle then. Um, all music is a struggle. All life is a struggle. All business is a struggle. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I should really say this. Uh, you, you might want to apply one of your claps here. But I, I look at a lot of the musicians talking about how bad the scene is on Facebook. And I've never said it, but I often think, I wonder if there's any other industry where people complain so much about how difficult things are. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a graphic designer. I'm a graphic designer in a large city. There's a lot of work in Sydney, but there's also an awful lot of other very good graphic designers going for that work. So you have opportunity and you have, um, uh, you know, your, your ability uh, so, I, I, I've always worked to the current reality of it. Um, now, I'm, I'm sure a lot of music would shout me down about this, but I don't think it's so bad as long as you adapt yourself to what's going on. Yeah, I think, you know? I think most people are. I think maybe those people that are saying and complaining so much are people that aren't really willing to adapt. Yes, they're, they're, they're just wanting it to stay like it was, sure. and it's sure. not like it was anymore. So no, it must it isn't. be shit. You know? and, and and look, Steve, as, as as an old guy myself, I do find a lot of people of my generation go, well, why can't it be like the old days? Mm. But I mean, there's a very good answer for that. It can't be like the old days because it isn't the old yeah. days. It is what it is. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. I, I I I, you know, in 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 every aspect of my life. I go, well, it is what it is. And I mean, you can't fight it. And the, if, if you take the energy that you would use, you know, feeling bad about it and fighting it and complaining about it and actually applying it to going, okay, how can I do what I want to do but modify it in a way, you know? Um, and, and, and look, it, it's still a struggle. It's, and, and it, you know, I'm not saying it's an answer, God, there's still weeks where I go, Jesus, how hard can it be? Mm -hmm. But then something comes up yeah. and I go, cool, okay, that's fine. That worked for me and this worked for me. So until I, I can absolutely get absolutely no gigs or nobody interested to play with me, I'll just keep applying this to it. And I, I, I really love what I, I, I'm it doing. It definitely doesn't seem like that's happening for you. You're... Well, You're look, it work, man. yes, I, I look. I, I, I guess I, I am. Look, there's an, always an enormous amount of luck involved, um, and really, I think with with any any business or or any venture you you have in your life, the trick is to be ready when opportunity comes up. Yep. You know, um, look, one of my favourite people in the Sydney music scene is. is uh, Lauren Benson, Loz Benson. Uh, you know of her? I do. Yes, she's 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 fabulous. Yep. You know, she she played in my JHD revival band. Yep. Just a cracker player, yep. wonderful player. So, you know, next thing I know, here she is touring all over the world with John Butler. Yep. And nailing it. And I had lunch with her um, after she came back. Just the same sweet Loz. And she looks at me and she says, "So what have you been doing?" Mm. I think. What are you talking about? What have I been doing? <laughs> what have you been doing? Yeah. But yeah. you know, humble. Yeah. Humble, you know, and, and a lot of that comes from her family culture. The Bensons are incredibly forward thinking, positive people, you know, and they just go, well, get on with it. Yeah. You know, and, and she's applied that 
and whatever comes up in her musical life, she's just ready for it, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but she hasn't changed as a person. I'm, and I know loads of people like that. They're bursting with talent um, and ability and things bob up for them and they just nail it with a smile on their face, you yeah, know? Yeah. And they're the sort of people that I love because I know how hard it is to do that. Yeah. It's all too easy to sort of sit back and go, oh, woe is me. Things ain't happening the way I want them to. Well, you know, where's that in the job description? You know, I mean, whoever said that, that things would happen because you wish them to happen like that, you know? I'm very lucky in that my mother um, hit me with the Protestant work ethic very early yeah, on. Yeah. She was German. She survived the Second World War, as my father did. So I grew up in a household of people who survived the Second World War. So really, my problems are very, very small. Yeah. <laughs> compared. Yeah. No, really, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it sounds yeah. a bit silly, but, but it's true. I grew up with these people and yeah. they didn't complain about it. And when I found out their history, I thought, wow, you know, you got through that. Mm -hmm. My pimples really aren't such a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the JHD Revival Band. Okay, yep. the JHD Revival Band. Well, as I said, it, it, it grew um, amazingly out of, out of just a small jazz trio. Um, and then I got... Uh, uh, double bass players and, and, and it was a jazz thing and then um, I went to see uh, I was doing a gig at the Tokyo Hotel at Darling Harbour yeah. and there was another band on there uh, which was a rockabilly band um, band was terrible drummer was fantastic that was Loz Benson mm. she was a drummer and I said to her in the break man you know where do you learn to play a shuffle like that because mm. For some odd reason, that is how I judge a drummer. I don't know why, but yep. they can be as funky as... But a shuffle, yep. to me, just to my ear, separates the sheep from the goats. Because it, it's not just the shuffle, as you... I'm not telling you anything, but as you know, it's all those little suggested ghost notes around the beat, you know. Some people play a shuffle like a typewriter. Yep. Sounds terrible, you know. But Lozzie just played this beautiful juicy flowing shuffle i just thought it was gorgeous anyway i said to her you know oh you know um where'd you learn to play shuffle like that and she said oh is it bad i said it's incredible <laughs> then i met her mum and dad and i realized where she learned to play the shuffle from they had steeped her and her sister emily in classic rock you know great you know stuff so they had they'd listen to all the canned heat and all that stuff there. um and uh and anyway, um, I said to Jeff, oh, um, uh, so lo lo sorry, Lozzie said to me, oh, look, you know, my sister sings. Um, can she sing with the band? And I thought, oh, you know, here we go. You know, uh, somebody's sister who sings, you know, had that before. And anyway, uh, Emily did one gig with us and blew my head off. You know, I just thought she is incredible. And I said to Jeff, her dad, uh, look, man, I'd love her to be in my band. Is that cool with you? You know, he said, no. And I went, what? I said, is everything cool? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, she can be in your band next year. I said, well, why? What's wrong with this year? And she said, he said, this year I wanted to concentrate on her at HSC. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's how young she was. Yeah, right. You know, incredible. So yeah. Emily, Emily, uh, yeah, she, she joined my band. And her voice was like so... Um, oh, soulful and strong I, I thought I've just got to toughen the band up you know so so you know I got a, a, the bass player to play electric bass um, was he not playing electric bass uh, she was she was, was, was playing acoustic bass because we were doing a jazz thing yep. uh, but Emily's voice I just could hear that it needed to get pumped up a bit you know yep. move away from jazz more into the like soul uh, rhythm, uh, rhythm and blues, um, funk, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, got a conga player, and bit by bit, you know, like look, we we did a party, and and um, Ed Hughes, uh, he he was picking up a, a friend of his from the party, and he picked up a, a tambourine, he just started playing the tambourine. And I thought, you know, as, as a drummer, you know how hard it is to play the tambourine properly, well, you know. So he was playing this tambourine, and I said to him, man, you know. 
do you play any other percussion? He said, yeah, I play uh, congas and timbales. I said, would you like to join a band? So before I knew it, I had a nine-piece band, you know, yep. lot with three, three horns, uh, three saxophones, um, just just incredible. And, and I was like a pig in shit. I would sit at home and I would write out arrangements. I, I was just like in heaven. You know, I'd write arrangements. Uh, we would do some uh, some originals, even the covers. I would take them apart and pull them to you know put them back together again. Um, absolutely, uh, just just in heaven doing this stuff. Show up to the rehearsal, put the charts in front of everybody, count it in, and after the first run through, I'd say, guys, remind me why are we rehearsing again? Yeah, yeah because right. they just nail this shit down. I was just so beautiful, you know. Yeah. I just it was just an absolute utter pleasure. Uh, I must say, um, in that band, at the nine piece, four guys, five girls. And it made the whole experience beautiful. Fantastic. You know, yeah. everybody got on. The vibe was lovely. You know, it was uh, just a lot of fun. A lot of fun, you know. And I mean, uh, I'm not a blokey bloke. Um and I've enjoyed, you know, being in bands with blokes, but just having this mix of, of you know, young and old. It was a very diverse band in every way, um, and that was a, a real big part of it, you know. And the actual full name of the band was a JHD Revival Band and Travelling Medicine Show. Yeah. Because when I, I remember looking at a picture of the band going, you know, we've got so much in this band. You know, we've got so many different people. It looks like a... Uh, one of those cool kind of you know ragtag uh, like a like a fa like, I'm a very visual person and I just the band just looked great you know <laughs> um, and, and, like you know there was and and, and and you know people would come and see us and they'd go God, a lot of girls in that band and I, and I didn't really think of it like that I, I thought well yeah so what you know I mean but it was it was a a, a heck of a thing it was a really interesting looking band sounding band um yeah everything about it was just just absolutely fantastic and i was very fortunate that we were supported um hugely by uh, an, a, a couple of venues uh, lazy bones we played it a number of times which was great because um the stage there is really big um i don't remember do you remember the mac the yeah, mac yeah. hotel yeah absolutely yeah well that was a, a great funky house yeah. you know and i I, I, I pushed Nathan for gigs there for a long time yep. and he, he didn't really respond. And then one day he said, look, we've had a band drop out. Can you do this? And I went, yes. I didn't even ask the band because yeah. I thought, I'm going to ask the band. If one of them dares to say no, <laughs> I will go to their house. Yep. I will kidnap them. I will put them <laughs> in my van and they will do the gig. Great. No, but, but luck, <laughs> through incredible serendipity, um, they could all do that, that, that night. Um, and it was a cracker, and we, we played, you know, heaps of nights at the Mac. Um, the other one was the uh, the Townie, a wonderful Townie at Newtown, mm -hmm. um, and Sally there, we couldn't fit on the stage, so she would arrange that we, half the rhythm section was on the stage, the horns, me and the singer were like on the floor, yeah. you know, and, yeah. she'd, and Sally would, set, you know, she'd set up a million mics, and but she just really made it sound great you know so I, I i thank all of those venues for putting up with a, a very logistically difficult band but i think all the venues and the people involved appreciated that it takes a while to get this band set up and happening but once it happens it's a very happening band yeah. you know and i know there's many people who came to see the band that it just knocked their socks off you know right. so I, I couldn't be prouder of that of, of that band um I'll never do it again um, because it's one of those things that as you, I think when you're young, there's a lot of things you do because you 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 don't know that it can't be done. Yep. You know? So I think that was, was a thing for me. I didn't know how difficult it was to drag a nine-piece band of cracker musicians around Sydney. Yep. I didn't know how difficult it was. So I did it. Now I'm 
Sh- old, and I, and I think I'll never do that again. Yeah. Which is stupid, really. Yeah. But but anyway, I mean, I, I no, I'm I'm very happy with what I'm doing now. I I, I feel very good about it, and it's 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 the exact opposite. Yep. Nothing is really that. arranged. Yep. There's no charts. Yep. Yep. There's the jazz thing of, of head charts, counting stuff in, seeing what happens. Everybody's got big ears, and it's um, that that's that's the that's that's the other way I, I like to make music. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's yeah. a it's a beautiful way of making music. You know, yep. um, especially with people who, even though I don't necessarily play jazz, it's more blues now. I like to play with jazz players mm-hmm. because they really you can throw jazz players in at the deep end with the the barest skeleton of the song yep. and they can just sound great you know it's just it's just that incredible education that they have to undergo you know which which I've never done so I, I utterly admire these people you know I look at these people and I think man you're 22 years old how the hell can you do that? <laughs> you know? It kills me. Yeah. Yeah, it just kills me. Yeah. Mm. So where, are you looking to the future? Um, yeah, well... M- Music-wise? Yes, but yep. the, I think the future... In, in the past, I used the future used to be um, a, a much more defined thing. I used to go, right, you know, six months, we're going to do an album. Okay. You know, going to do that. Oh, sorry, and, you... You, you guys did an album with the JHD Revival? I did uh, two albums. With, oh, with, did you? Okay. Are, yeah. they, are they available? For yeah, they are. I'm going to give you a couple. Well, I, I, I'll link them in the show notes. Yeah, sure. So okay. You can yeah, find cool. them. And, yeah, no, yeah. wonderful. Cool. Um, no, we did an EP, which was a live EP. Yep. And then we did a recording with uh, Michael Wheatley yep. um, at Nut and Butter Studios. Uh, he was our keyboard player at the time. Yep. Uh, he did a wonderful job. Um, did a, 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 an, an album. Uh both of which sound absolutely fantastic. So I'm very glad to have um, some kind of um, record of that that band. You yep. know, to have it to have never recorded it would have killed me. You know, I think there will be. In fact, I'll probably get it back together in just to record. Just recording, you know, yeah. right. because really to have nothing like. You know, I mean, it's a, it was just a, a hell of a thing. Um, yeah, but but you know, like like the the future now is a lot less. Um, a lot less kind of defined. Normally I kind of work out some kind of strategy over the, the following year, you know, because like booking agents like to know that there's, that, you know, you're you're doing their gig as an event, you know, and, and, okay. and you like to say to them, yeah, well, this, we're launching something or, I'm, yeah, you know, yeah. we're, we're relaunching something or yep. or some, something special about it. And I think that that kind of makes sense. It's really good, you know, yep. rather than just saying, come to my gig, it's a great gig. Um, but... Uh, the the current unit I'm just I'm just taking it a little bit kind of um, yeah a little bit kind of easier awesome. on that yeah just just um, just actually enjoying it in a slightly more day to day kind of thing you know whatever the the gig comes up so I might have a gig and you know person A might be able to do it um, which is a, a a case of a, a gig that's coming up. So I've I found a, a whole other person that hasn't never been in my orbit, but is now in the orbit. So that that's cool. I mean that that to me I, I love the idea of of the fact that you know you you really have no idea. I have no idea what this band is going to be this time next year. Yeah. It, it, and I'm sure it'll be something that I entirely didn't predict. You know. Yeah. So mm. just chilling, being very zen-like. Very good. Um. <laughs> yeah, I think on that, John Hardaker, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Um, thank you, Stevie. Can't wait to get your story out there. Sweet. Cheers, Lovely man. man. Thank, thank you, you sir. Much, Cheers. <laughs>